Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that doesn't care who you vote for in November, so long as the show is the president of your heart. What's that? Your heart's an oligarchical collective? chairman of your... Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, today I want to go ahead and take a look at a game called Clockwork Wars from Eagle Griffin Games. Clockwork Wars, for two to four players from Eagle Griffin Games, is a game that meticulously simulates the unification of the Italian peninsula by Garibaldi in the mid-19th century. Or, or it's a steampunk game featuring purebreed humans, rhinoceros humans, dog humans, and chimpanzee humans. It's, it's one or the other. I, I can't remember which. The game is a game of civil war amongst these various factions. As I say, you have uh, uh, these, these kind of purebreed humans who have you know, very specific characteristics. You have these kind of dog humans that, 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 are, that are these hybrids. You have these chimpanzee human hybrids and you have these rhinoceros human hybrids. They all have their own characteristics, their own ways of, of fighting war, their own unique uh, units that are going to come out of the board, and a lot more besides. Now, the game is set up almost kind of like a Settlers of Catan game. You've got all the various uh, uh, tiles that you put out there. Now, the back of the book has kind of some suggestions for creating, uh, you know, setup rules for two to three to four players. Or you can go ahead and just kind of set up your own or do it randomly, however, however you like. Now, each player is also going to take 30 discs. Now, these discs are their workers, their soldiers, and uh, they're going to have them kind of in a, uh, a reserve pool, a recruitment pool, I should say. Then what's going to happen is each player uh, has a capital. Now, throughout the game, the capital cannot be conquered. It cannot be taken over. It is kind of your, uh, you're always guaranteed your capital because it's always going to give you four of those workers. Now, the basic game plays out in seven rounds. Uh, Round 1 and 2 is the early age, 3 and 4 is the middle age, and 5 through 7, that is kind of the, the last age, the, the third age. And each age is going to unlock different abilities and discoveries, as we'll see. Now, the very first phase of the game is the Spy Master phase. What you're going to do is be able to take a token from uh, the, the scoring track that's going to let you do some fun and interesting things, but you can only choose one of them. You play it and you take it in turn order. There's things like uh, R&D. Essentially, you can grab two espionage cards, see which one you like, take it, put the other one on the bottom. You're going to play maybe the conscription, take the conscription token, which lets you get an extra worker right at the beginning of the game. You're going to get like the Tactical Ops card, which will grant you abilities in combat. You can grab the Gambit token, which will allow you to move two of your workers on the board, which normally you can't do. And there are a few other different things that you can do during this phase as well, different tokens you can take as well. Next up, you have the Recruitment phase. Now, the Recruitment phase essentially lets you grab four workers from your recruitment, put them into a reserve behind your player screen. So you can grab four of those to put them behind your player screen at that time. Your capital always gives you four of those workers. But you also get workers from the villages you have on the board. Now, if you have uh, already have a disc in a village, that will give you one more worker. If you have three discs in a village, then that will give you two workers. Now, after you've recruited all of the uh, units that you're entitled to, what you're going to do is the deployment phase. Now, each player behind the screen has a deployment sheet. Uh, this is a piece of paper that comes with it. You do have to use your own pens or pencils. But what you're going to do is essentially write where you're going to deploy them. Now, your tiles are, the tiles on the board are all out there. And from your capital, you can essentially go out to any space that is adjacent to your capital. You can even go up to two spaces away provided in the intervening uh, hex you place at least one of your workers there as well. 
But what you're doing is you're putting them on the different uh, tiles to give you different advantages. As I say, the villages and cities will give you more workers to recruit next round. But there's also the science uh, centers, there's the shrines, there's the towers that are going to help you out in various ways. You're also going to score lakes and forests. So you want to kind of spread out as much as you can. So after you write down how many discs you're going to put in what locations, then you all reveal your deployment card. When you reveal it, then you all look and you place your tokens where they are. Now, of course, if some of your discs, which are now on the board, are called soldiers, if some of your soldiers are in the same spot as an enemy's soldiers or an opponent's soldiers, you're going to do combat. Now, combat is fairly simple and straightforward here. What happens is uh, you each have a, can, can do reinforcements. Based, based on turn order, you can figure out uh, who gets their kind of reinforcement phase first. If you have a citadel right next to the combat, you can actually move units from the citadel into the combat, but it does have to be adjacent. You also have some cards and some discovery abilities that may allow you to tinker with combat as well. After uh, the first player, a per person in first player order does it, then the next person can do it, and then essentially just look who has the most power, who has the most strength. Strength. And then you kind of eliminate all of the uh, units that uh, aren't matched with strength. Whoever remains then, of course, won the combat and gets to claim that tile. So, for instance, if you had uh, three units and five units, you'd both lose three units, and the two units that would remain would be, of course, the ones that claim the tile. Now, after combat, you have something called the attrition stage, which essentially means uh, any units that are not in supply, meaning you cannot trace a direct line from your uh, citadel, or pardon me, from your capital to that unit. It's cut off, and you have to lose at least one unit from that square. If you only got one unit, then of course he's gone. Next, you have the research phase. You look at the tiles that produce sorcery, that produce uh, religion, that produce science. And you go ahead and you get one token for every uh, one of those hexes that your people occupy. Once you've collected all of the, the tokens that you're due, you can then spend tokens, again, in player order on discoveries. Now, there's kind of a, a grid of kind of nine different things you can choose from. Three science, three sorcery, three religion, but of course they're divided into early age, middle age, late age. And so what you're going to do is you can look through the, the whatever age you're in and find the card that you want, and if you can afford it, you go ahead and you buy it, and that gives you a certain advantage. You place a corresponding token on one of your, your, your science areas, your towers, uh, or, your, or your shrines. You, you, you have to have enough uh, physical places to kind of upkeep your discoveries. You can even place one uh, of any on your capital. You can also activate any abilities that may have come with discoveries, and you can also at this time, instead of buying a discovery or even while you buy a discovery, because you can buy multiple discoveries at a time, uh, you can also buy a general. Now, there are three generals in this game, but the, the, the insert came with spaces for more, so I suspect there'll be some expansions. And what you can do is you can buy these generals, which are very powerful military units. Units. There's a Leviathan, there's a Sting Tank, there's a Crusader. And all of these units, as I say, are very, very powerful. And they bring kind of unique uh, ideas to battle. Now, at the end of every age, so two, four, seven, you're also going to have a scoring phase. Essentially, uh, if you have uh, up to three units in a forest, you can score one, two, and three in a forest. You have to have at least two units in a uh, lake to score three victory points, but that's how you're going to gain, basically, victory points uh, during the scoring phase. You also have court dominance, and what court dominance is, is of course at the beginning of the game, you've chosen a specific court. These are kind of courts, they're kind of like specific scenarios for the game, but they give you different advantages. Whoever has the most uh, players in court gets that specific advantage. You can deploy to court just like you deploy to uh, other places on the board. Finally, you have the pollution stage. And pollution simply means that all of the resource areas, the science areas, the religion areas, the uh, sorcery areas, you have to kind of remove all of your discs, all of your soldiers, except for one. You also have unique units uh, that you can deploy uh, during the deployment phase, which are special to each faction. And they can be killed most of the time, and they, they have unique powers, and they can do fun and interesting things. Uh, the cards, the discoveries, these are all things that can kind of be game changers that can mix it up, uh, mix up the game a little bit. Now, at the end of the game, the very last scoring phase you do, you're going to go ahead and, of course, score whatever uh, 
you know, tree, forests, and uh, lakes you have. But then you're going to go ahead and you're going to score any tokens, unspent tokens that you've got. They're going to be worth one victory point for every three tokens you've got of any of any kind. Then you're also going to see if any of your uh, discovery cards offer you any victory point advantages. Then whoever has the most points at the end of scoring wins Clockwork Wars. So, um, bef before I talk about anything else <clears throat> about Clockwork Wars, I want to talk about the production of this game. Um, let me just say, this is a beautiful, beautiful game. I think this is just dazzling. Um, now, it does have the wooden discs, which, you know, it would be nice if it had, I don't know, something a little more miniature-y, miniature, min min like minis. That would have been nice, um, but I can understand. You've got 30 of these things, so that, you know, for what it is, it, it works okay. The, the minis that you have for the generals are really cool, although the tank's kind of turret kind of hangs down. Um, I, I, I like them a lot. I, I wish there were more minis in the game, but, you know, it is what it is. What minis there are are pretty, pretty decent. Um, but just the artwork... Man, the artwork of this game blows you away. This game has some brilliant, brilliant artwork. I really love the art here. Um, there is something about art, really cool art like this, that can really pull you into a universe and into a theme. And this game does that very well. You really get the steampunk theme coming through with these various races and what they can do through the artwork. I, that nailed it. This game nailed that very much. Great production. Really good production. It's a heavy box. It's a big box. This is a kind of game when you buy a game, you know you've got a you've got a game, you know. So on that front, no, really no complaints. I'm I'm very happy with the production here. Really like this game's production. The gameplay itself. <clears throat> Let me say first of all, I was incredibly pleased, incredibly pleased to see for as as dense looking, as complex looking as this game is, to see just how easy to learn and to play it is. This game is really quite easy to learn. I mean, you read the rule book and concepts you just get. There were one or two things that didn't make sense at first, but within a turn or two, it just it all fell into place. And very easy game to, to learn and to jump into. And that's something I like a lot. I like games that have a lot of rules that are, that are you know, a lot going on, but they're fairly easy to learn. This game nails that, too. Now, gameplay itself. Um, you know, this is a game that... It requires a lot of, of strategy. It requires a lot of strategic thought, kind of on, on a few levels here. Um, because, you, you know, you obviously, it's a game that forces conflict. You know, it, it, it kind of has to to be what it is. It forces conflict. And I like that. I like games that you just can't sit and turtle the whole game. You have to kind of get aggressive at some point. This game does that, and it does it quite well. Um, but also, too, it, it's a game where you where you got to think, do I want to balance, do I want to leverage my ability to take over another area with maybe trying to, to get more in, in the discoveries that, that could help me in other ways? Or, or at the same time, do I want to deploy my units to, to kind of help me defend uh, against you know, possible attacks because I know there's areas that they're you know, covetous eyes or watching? Uh, in short, it's a game that is filled with tough decisions, which, again, you've heard me say many times, is the hallmark of any good game. Does it give you tough decisions? Clockwork Wars does. Uh, throughout, it gives you good, good, mm, solid decisions. Um, now, I am not a fan. If you if you if you know me at all, if you watch the videos at all, you know I am not a fan of deterministic combat. I'm not a fan of just you know you've got three units, you've got five, you win by two. I'm I don't like that in general. Uh, I take a lot of flack because I'm not a fan of Small World, because other than that one little die roll, that it's pretty much just deterministic combat, and I don't care for it. But uh, having said that, the, 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 the way the combat worked, the deterministic combat in, this, combat in this game worked, reminded me a lot where you play cards, and you have these special units that can mitigate things and add things to it. It really reminded me of gameplay. It wasn't exact, but it did kind of remind me of gameplay from a Game of Thrones, the board game, which is a game I like a lot, even though it's largely deterministic combat. Uh, so what I'm saying is, even though I'm not a fan of deterministic combat in general, in fact, I know I know I heard the uh, the uh, uh, designer of this game mention at some point that he deliberately decided he didn't like the luck of rolling dice. I do. I like checking dice. That's just me. But I also like being able to mitigate things. Um, so what I'm saying is it didn't bother me in this game. I think it worked well. For, for, for the way the game works, it, it 
did. I was very happy with it. And you, you're doing the math in your head as you're doing the deployments and stuff. And it, it worked. It's happening. So in short, um, let me just say, too late, let me just say this game is a game that plays as good as it looks. Clockwork Wars from Eagle Griffin Games is a winner on all fronts, babies. It's awesome. I really, really enjoyed this game. I think it's one that, uh, you know, if you like kind of games that are, that are, that are, there's strategic depth and there's, and there's some scope and scale and great theme, great arc, but at the same time, it's not so dense that it's going to bog you down or take too long or out, outlive its welcome. A game plays maybe 90 minutes, maybe you could stretch it to two hours, but it's not going to play that long. This is a game for you. I really like Clockwork Wars. Check it out. The recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Clockwork Wars is buy it. Thank you once again for joining us today for The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on BoardGameGeek, on our Facebook page, or on the discriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, and i got to tell you, when I first heard the name Clockwork Wars, I actually thought it would be a game about, uh, I am the evil watch that you wear with your Sunday best. But I'm the sports watch! We must fight! Rah, 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 rah. Oh, the second half, the second half! Yay!